Hello and welcome to the St. Charles City County Library. My name is Elizabeth Nelson, the Classes and Events Coordinator. I'm very excited for you to join us here on Facebook Live tonight. This evening, we have local radio host Charlie Brennan with us. Charlie is here to discuss his second solo book, what he calls the least anticipated book of 2020. <laughs> The title is Only in St. Louis, The Most Incredible, Strange, and Inspiring Tales. Charlie is a longtime show host at KMOX, 1120 AM, and is provocateur of KETC Channel 9 public affairs show Donnybrook. Charlie has been voted St. Louis's favorite talk show host four times in the readers' polls of the Riverfront Chimes. In 1998, the St. Louis Press Club named him Media Person of the Year and USA Today named him one of America's top 25 most influential radio talk show hosts. A native of Cleveland, Ohio, Charlie graduated from Boston College and worked in Boston radio for six years before joining KMOX in St. Louis in 1998. Charlie's uh, first solo book came out in 2013, Amazing St. Louis, 250 Years of Great Tales and Curiosities. He also co-authored the two 2006, Here's Where, A Guide to Illustrious St. Louis with Bridget Garwitz and Joe Latop. If you're looking for a copy of Charlie's book, please visit Main Street Books, our local independent bookstore. You can check out their website, mainstreetbooks.net. And copies are going fast, so you'll want to get yours quick. If you have a comment or question for Charlie, please post it in a comment below this post. And now without further ado, uh, welcome Charlie. Elizabeth, thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's yeah. great to be back with the St. Charles City County Library. Yes, so you've been been in person several times to the St. Charles City County Library, but uh, our first Zoom meeting here. Right, we've had some good times and I, I've interviewed some people at the uh, library too, including Larry Swedro from Buckingham okay. Asset yeah. Management and others and uh, mm -hmm. always have had a good time. So thanks for including me again. Wonderful. Well, we'll have you back in person when we can okay. eventually, <laughs> but sure. we'll, we'll do the, the Zoom virtual uh, meeting tonight. So, um, so you are here for our only in St. Louis here and you've got the beautiful arch on the cover here. Did you get to choose the, the photo there? Yes. Okay. The There's a little, okay. Well, um, a couple of things. I have this theory that a cover is very important for a book. I know it sounds superficial, but some people do judge a book by a cover, especially if it's self-published. If it looks a little bit mm, mm. low rent, you got to be careful. So I went to the Arch with my daughter's boyfriend, who is uh, a midshipman at the uh, at Naval Academy in Annapolis. And he snapped away some photos on a very windy day. My hair was crazy and the sun was <laughs> in my eyes. It didn't work out too well. He did a great job. Uh, mm. And the photo that you saw earlier with me next to that statue, he did that. But then I had to go back and I got a guy by the name of Rob Westrich. I hired him and we, we met at sunrise at the arch and the, you'll see on the one leg of the arch, it looks a little bit yellow. That's actually the reflecting sun on the right hand oh, no, side there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. That's, okay. that's the sun coming up from the, sure. from the direction of Illinois. But oh, wow. um, we, we had many different uh, covers to choose from. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I don't look great in many of them, if any of them. So that was like the one that seemed to be okay. Oh, geez, I think you're too hard on yourself. Uh, but yeah, like sunrise. Yeah, that was pr that's pretty good for sunrise. I, I don't look that awake at sunrise ever. <laughs> oh well, you know when you're uh, w when you're writing books, you tend to have some odd hours. Sunrise is nothing. That's okay. I mean, that's, that's the least of my concerns. Oh. <laughs> uh. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about the um, inspiration for this book. You had the Amazing St. Louis and mm -hmm. uh, now we're on to the Only in St. Louis. Well, Amazing St. Louis came out in 2013, roughly in co coordination with the 250th birthday of the city, which was in uh, 2014. Okay. Right. Uh, February mm -hmm. 15th of 2014. So, I, I had been collecting all these stories that were kind of superlatives about St. Louis, the biggest, the greatest. And that was the first book, amazing things that kind of made you sit up in your swivel chair. But yeah. along the way, I collected a lot of strange stories and um, people were sending me strange stories. So I thought, I think I'd like to put together a book called Strange St. Louis. And there is a chapter on Strange St. Louis, mm -hmm. but I was also getting other stories 
funny stories, stories with a twist, some inspiring stories. The last chapter involves people who started out really slow in life and then became huge successes, all with okay. connections to St. Louis. Yeah. So I thought I'd just say only in St. Louis. My sister actually came up with the, uh, uh, the okay. title while we were walking one day. I said, you know, that's what I want. I, I think strange St. Louis is a little too, too much of a downer. Mm -hmm. And well, to make, I know the story's already too long, but to summarize, um, I had all these ideas in a folder and the mm -hmm. pandemic gave me a reason to pull out the folder and make use of myself while I was okay. in quarantine. Okay. So you, you collected these over time. It wasn't a, I had yes. the idea for a story and then I'm going out and getting the story. It was that, you had a little bit of both, but mostly I would interview people. I would uh -huh. read a book. I would mm -hmm. read the newspaper and I'd say, wow, that's weird. Or that's inspiring. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, one of my favorite stories was interviewing Ed McMahon, but it's also in his book. You might be a little too young for this story, but he was second in command to Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. He okay. was the second banana for years, but he was okay. also a spokesperson for Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch. Okay. And now, I remember he had a show that was like um, something about the stars. Not, um, Star Search, maybe? Yes, that one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That he was also did yeah. bloopers and practical jokes, and I think okay. he was associated with the American Clearinghouse, gave away a million dollars. Yes. And, yeah. and he acted in some movies, too. He, he had a slight acting career. But he was okay. best known for being the sidekick to Johnny Carson. Right. Yeah. He comes to St. Louis for a meeting for Anheuser Busch with the advertising agency, which was Darcy Mays' Betton and Bulls. And okay. you should probably know that they did all the ad advertising for Anheuser Busch. They they did the famous Coca-Cola campaign, the pause that refreshes. They did many outstanding campaigns in the 20th century. Well, he's in town. James Bush Orthwine is the head of Darcy Mazius. And after their dinner at Tony's, Orthwine says, let's go to my house for a nightcap. Uh -huh. Ed McMahon, who's not from here, he lives in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. He got in the car with his driver and they went out to Huntley, those big mansions. Uh -huh. And he was the first to arrive. He lets himself in. He pours himself a drink after turning on the lights. He turns on the stereo, sits down on the couch. He puts his feet on the couch and a woman in her night coat nightgown comes to the landing with two kids she goes what are you doing in my house uh -huh. he said well this is the orthwine house right she goes no this is the greasedick house <laughs> he not only went into the wrong house but the greasedicks own falstaff beer so <laughs> he, he politely excused himself and he left but can you imagine her name was bunny greasedick and i don't know what she was oh, thinking with a, a major national television star had kind of invaded her home yeah Oh, wow. Yeah, I can't imagine what would be running through her mind. <laughs> well, yeah. So when I came across that story, I go, that, that's got to be in the book, you know, and there's a, there are a lot of mm -hmm. stories like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of, uh, one of my favorites was uh, the Mother Teresa story. Yeah. Um, that, that was a, I don't know if you want to spoil it or not for everyone, but there is a, a fun twist at the end that you, you definitely don't expect from Mother well, Teresa. Or... Maybe I if, you, if you're around Roman Catholic circles long enough, you do appreciate this uh, or see a, <laughs> see a pattern here. Oh. Um, <laughs> essentially, uh, the White family uh, was in a real distress. And this was the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, and Mrs. White was in the hospital. Okay. So uh, they called the local convent, the sisters, of the missionary sister, missionary sisters in North St. Louis, looking for some prayers. And a woman answered the phone and said, hang on a moment, Mr. White. And um, she handed the phone to another nun. And the nun who picked up the phone said, this is Mother Teresa. How may I help you? Now, at that time, Mother Teresa was maybe the most famous woman, maybe the most famous person on the planet, right? Yeah. Known for her great charitable work. Mm -hmm. And she was in town, as it turns out, for mm -hmm. a speaking engagement. Mr. White's wife was in the hospital i guess at the right time how lucky was she but yeah. so um mother Teresa says come on over pick me up we'll go to the hospital and so the whites got in their station wagon picked up mother Teresa, drove to saint luke's hospital in chesterfield mm -hmm. and when they got in the door it was like the parting of the red sea when people did double takes wow mother Teresa is here and then she prayed with mrs white for about oh 15 minutes yeah. and then the whites father and son 
drove her back to the convent. And on the way, Mr. White thanked her profusely. And she said, now you can help me. You're a developer, aren't you? Our convent needs a soup kitchen in North St. Louis. And in fact, Mr. White was a well-known developer. He developed Westport Plaza. And so he built for the missionary sisters, a soup kitchen, which still stands there today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a, yeah. I was like, but oh, I could, it, you could do something for me. <laughs> well, well, you know, let me say this. Um, I, I know in a previous life, you studied at St. Louis University. There are probably yeah. times when representatives of this institution for higher learning call you for a little donation. Uh, <laughs> I know I went to some Catholic schools and mm -hmm. those calls still are coming in. I'll blow mm -hmm. these many years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so you um you're originally not from st louis correct you're from, you that's right from, from ohio um what since your time in st louis what has been for you the most surprising thing i know you're kind of out there looking for looking for stuff about st louis but do you oh, have a well overall the overarching thing is i never thought that st louis had any history associated with it at all when i moved here i knew i knew it had the gateway arch but i yeah. i just didn't realize there were so many history-making individuals, history-making events that took place here. I mean, after all, I mean, let's just look at one thing. Uh, the Dred Scott decision, downtown mm -hmm. St. Louis, where a slave in 1846 sued for his freedom. The Supreme Court ruled in 1857 mm -hmm. um, when he lost his case that uh, black men did not have any rights that a white man was bound to respect. It led to sectional division, the mm -hmm. Civil War. Ken Burns says it was one of the three or four reasons that led to the Civil War. And mm -hmm. that that's that building, the old courthouse is still in downtown St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And the more I've been here since 1988, I see mm -hmm. one major historic event after another. Um, I mean, the Gemini program, the space program that McDonnell mm -hmm. Douglas had in the 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic, so mm -hmm. many different uh, events and people here who changed the world. When you think about it, my goodness, Mark Twain lived here for a while. He's sometimes considered our greatest writer. And uh, mm -hmm. Chuck Berry, the father of rock and roll, lived here. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, we had so many great musicians uh, from Miles Davis, Scott Joplin, uh, mm -hmm. W.C. Handy, Chuck mm -hmm. Berry. All You couldn't write books about jazz and the blues and rock and roll without mm -hmm. including these people. So I, I think that St. Louis has so much. I never knew that when I first came here. Okay, sure. I know growing up, um, I grew up in Wisconsin. And yeah, sure. St. Louis and Missouri were, um, you know... I, on my radar is existing, but not in the, you know, the, the forefront as you're describing it of so many um, major historical events and um, just richness and culture as well. I, I truly feel that way because we had a fella who saved the French wine industry uh, back mm -hmm. in the day in the 19th century when there, when there was a louse that was devastating the grapes in France. And it was a man okay. in St. Louis who came up with the plants that uh -huh. could actually grow um, proper grapes in France. Yeah. And then you had uh, th throughout St. Louis history, people who whose actions really changed the way people thought. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, even today, I mean, think about it. Twitter was invented by a barista from St. Louis, yeah. Jack yeah. Dorsey. Yeah. That's insane. Do you yeah. know the, the mutual fund was actually invented by a St. Louisan by the name of Rex <laughs> Singfield. He did it on September the 5th, 1973, working for uh, a bank in Chicago. He, by the way, an orphan from St. Louis, and he his index fund mm -hmm. uh, preceded John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard Investments, by okay. five years. Wow. So, yeah, it's, I mean, we we've done a lot here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so one fun story I wanted to ask you about too was a man um, was attacked by a shark. The it's a fact, Elizabeth. Yes. <laughs> Um, downtown St. Louis. <laughs> 1996, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was okay. visiting with John Ferrara, who is the president of the Convention and Visitors Commission, but also the president of the Pasta House at the time, the late great John okay. Ferrara, and our mutual friend, Bruce Summer, who ran the America Center. And we were, we were at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just visiting. When mm -hmm. Bruce got a call, you got to come right back to St. Louis, get on the next flight. Um, someone got bit by a shark. And as it turns out, <laughs> At the America Center, it was the, it was February, it was the boat show and there was a tank full of water and some employee or visitor, yeah. I don't know which, got too close to the tank and nipped some guy who did live. So it wasn't, oh, it wasn't Jaws. Right. So, 
we weren't looking at the floating remains or anything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was the I think the first and last shark uh, attack in St. Louis. Although yeah. you know a shark was captured, a bull shark in about seventy five pound bull shark in the nineteen thirties in Alton, which means that the shark had yeah. to swim about. 1400 miles now that was before oh. we had locks and dams so yeah. the flow was uninterrupted yeah. but uh, Still, he obviously was going the wrong way yeah and he was committed upstream the whole way he truly was and he was obviously male because he didn't stop and ask for directions <laughs> that's what the uh, mm -hmm. we, the oceanographers tell us anyway okay okay um so back to your book um what uh was so you've told us a lot of your, your favorite stories and a lot of the you know um kind of enjoyable parts about learning about st louis what was uh, most difficult about writing this one inertia just getting it okay. done and you mm -hmm. know um stephen ambrose a historian who mm -hmm. wrote about lewis and clark and many yeah. other issues says the key to this job is to apply the back of your seat to the top of a chair and so you really have to do that. But in life, there are so many distractions. And that's probably why the pandemic came in handy. Mm. Um, Chuck Berry, the father of rock and roll, mm -hmm. did go to prison three times. His uh -huh. third and final time was just for four months. It was for uh -huh. tax evasion. And he went to a correctional facility by the name of Lampoc, L-A-M-P-O-C, not too far outside of Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And he said, I'm going to get more out of this experience than they're going to get out of me. And his goal was four pages a day. And the result was Hail Hail, his best selling autobiography. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt that way. I'm going to get more out of this pandemic than the <laughs> pandemic will get out of me. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit around and watch Jake and the Fat Man reruns. Mm -hmm. I am going to write a book that I've always yeah. said I was going to. So, okay. you know, some people exercise, some people drank beer. I just wrote right. only in St. Louis. Write the book. Okay. Are you a um, morning writer then or evening or just like when the inspiration hits you? By and large in the evening. Yeah. Evening? Uh, because okay. morning time is uh, the time I get ready for my radio show. Yeah. Okay. So uh, evening was most convenient and it much, took much longer than I expected. I thought I could crank it out in about uh, 60 days because I had so much material already. Well, sure. I think I started in early April and finished maybe in mid-August, late August, something like that. And then of course there's the layout and the design. And when mm -hmm. you're self-publishing, there's a lot of those details that the author takes care of that you mm -hmm. don't think of. But I had some good help with a group called Davis Creative. My daughter did the illustrations. Um, my son did the footnotes. My daughter's boyfriend did the uh, index. Although okay. my daughter claims she did a lot of that too, but they can, <laughs> They'll be litigating that for years. Right. Yeah. And then I, I paid a kid at Wash U, uh, Noah Brown, to edit it. Okay. okay. And then, of course, Rob Westridge with the photo. Yeah. Okay. But I and really there's... encourage people to do this, Elizabeth, because it's the great the creative process really makes you feel good. It's I think okay. there's a neurological sweet spot that it mm -hmm. hits when you're producing something like this, even if no one buys it. It helps you in kind of a a dark period, sure. like um, a pandemic. Yeah. Do you find that writing is like your art then? Like that kind of people have a unique art outlet or creative? No, uh, I'm, I'm, it's not my thing. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that, that's a Steve Martin joke. He goes, he says, words are my, words are my thing. But um, no, it, for me, English is a second language. It's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it should be a second language. I, it seems so difficult to me. So I struggle at writing, but I do enjoy it. I, I okay. really enjoy getting something onto paper and mm -hmm. I don't know why, but yeah. um, I, I was told, you know, there's a paper shortage and also a lot of the printers like mine mm -hmm. really backed up. So there's a shortage of books and we're, mm -hmm. we're running out right now. Okay. And the reason is apparently a lot of people did write books in 2020. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people took advantage, like you said, of the time and, and use that creative outlet. Could be. And then yeah. I, I learned a small thing. If you put, covid in the title it will not be sold on amazon.com ah okay. yeah i don't know why but they don't want it yeah but you and you have no covid in your book i'm guessing that's my promise there's okay. no covid 
There's no coronavirus. There's no okay. Donald Trump. There's no Joe Biden. Not one iota. So this is an escape from, yeah, from the news. The escape I, I think we all need. Mm-hmm. No. Okay, we've got some audience questions floating in here. So uh, let's turn to those. Um, how many years have you been saving these stories? Largely seven. Mm -hmm. um, they, they actually, some of them might have even been a little bit longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think about seven. Uh, since 2013, when I wrote the book, Amazing St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And even I got two really good ones yesterday. There might be a volume two. I mean, we Coming might up. be getting close to a volume two. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Um, and then do you have enough material for another book? So I don't know if the, getting the, there, this audience. Not, not, not right now, but I'm okay. getting there. But if people want to send their strange, inspiring, incredible tales. Um, okay. I'd love way. to get them. And there were some that I just couldn't see. I, if you notice, this is book is unusual because where footnotes are required, I have them at the bottom of the page because mm -hmm. my wife Beth said, "I don't want to go to the back of the book to yeah, look to and see note the reference." Rough footnotes oh, good. Are the way to go. <laughs> you feel that way too. Yes. Good. Good. Well, hundred so percent. The two Beths. My wife is Beth. You're Elizabeth. Okay. I guess there you go. Yeah. Way you guys work. <laughs> well, um, so. Where the footnotes I put at the bottom, okay. and where I didn't have didn't need footnotes. Well, you'll you'll see those. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I would describe that, but it it takes a little bit of time to put those together. But I think it's really worth it. Okay. Yeah. Um. And for the well, the footnotes wise, um, are you just citing your sources, or are you kind of expanding? Um. Oh, you are an academic. I can tell that you must have at least <laughs> yeah. two master's degrees. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, the, no, they're, they're just citing sources. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I, I don't uh, go on to give the other side of the story or anything. Okay. I don't think I do anyway, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, yeah. And a lot of them were from interviews that I had. Like, for example, yeah. I interviewed Phil Donahue. Okay. Uh, he, you're probably too young to remember him, but he was a television star and he, he applied for work at KMOX and he got rejected. Oh, okay. And then there was, uh, let's see, who else? Larry King was mm -hmm. the, the general manager of KMOX, Robert Highland, really wanted Larry King to work there. Larry King said no. Okay. John Tesh, does that name ring a bell? He okay. was um, an announcer years ago for Entertainment Tonight, the Olympics, he has a radio show now. And yeah. uh, he's from Long Island, but he couldn't get a job at KMOX TV, now okay. known as KMOV, because the guy said he had a Southern twang. Well, the guy's from Long Island. I don't get that. Right. But um, so I interviewed these people and they told me those stories. Okay. Oh, that, yeah. That um, all the interviews must have been so fun. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Getting to talk to, to, I don't know, all these people. Well, and yeah. And some were amazing. One of the most amazing is um, that I talked to I.E. Millstone, who headed up Millstone Banger, Millstone Construction. Uh -huh. He constructed the second Bush Stadium, Highway 6440, the renovation of 6440, but also he created the Pruitt Igo Apartments, 33 okay. buildings, which was, you know, a very well known mm -hmm. urban disaster, urban okay. nightmare. And, um, but he also built a building, I believe it's 825 South Skinker, which is a luxury apartment building uh, on Skinker across from Forest Park. Right. Yep. I know where that is. Yeah. Well, he told me that the construction for both Pruitt Igo and mm -hmm. 825 South Skinker, exactly the same, the exact same construction. Now, the huh. architectural ornamentation might have been different, yeah. but other than that, yeah. bones of the building were identical, huh. which I think most people would find yeah. just hard, very hard to believe. Aside. And then I, I talked to Kenny Wayne Rogers, who's a great singer, and yeah. his worst moment ever in entertainment history was in St. Louis. He was opening for the Rolling Stones in the Bridges yeah. to Babylon tour. Okay. And um, his mic cord broke. And so he was in the middle of guitar solo and the stage was about 90 yards wide. And oh, no. he was running around the stage for five minutes trying to find the cord and plug it back in. Oh no. So, but oh. one of my favorite stories is uh, when Jimmy Carter was gonna have an a luncheon for economic advisors. 
uh-huh. called Tom Eagleton's office. Eagleton was the U.S. Senator from Missouri. And he said, I, I'd like uh, the labor leaders to come on out and talk to us uh-huh. in Washington at the White House. Well, one of the labor leaders was Ed Finkelstein. Mm-hmm. Problem was someone in Eagleton's office gave the address for the wrong Ed Finkelstein to Jimmy oh. Carter's staff. The Ed, and so Jimmy Carter's staff sent the invitation for this economic summit luncheon to a mechanic in University City whose garage was <laughs> oh, at the corner wow. of Midland and Balson, whose name was Ed Finkelstein. Yeah. And he RSVP'd yes. And he showed up. That's awesome. And the press figured it out. They go, wow. They go, this is amazing. Uh, and they said, how'd you like? He goes, president, he did good. He did good. So. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh my but he goodness. had never been to DC before and not every day the president invites you. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I got an invitation, then. Sure. Yeah. There you go. Oh man. Okay. Next one. Um, I've heard that the first cocktail party was held in St. Louis in the central West end. Do you have any information about this or was this another important first? It's true. And I believe the year was uh, 1917, the home of Mrs. Julius Walsh in the 4,500 block of Lindell. And this is corroborated by both the Wall Street Journal and the St. Paul Pioneer Press. It was okay. the first time the term cocktail party had ever been used. It was introduced into the vernacular, according okay. to St. Paul Pioneer Press, at this party. Um, Mrs. Walsh, I believe was the, uh, I mean, it's, it's a major mansion there. Mm-hmm. And she, um, she had people over on a Sunday afternoon, poured mm-hmm. these alcoholic beverages, called a cocktail party. And so that was a St. Louis first. I have that in my book, Amazing St. Louis. Okay. And interestingly enough, that address, which I believe is 4510 Lindell, but I better double check that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the current residence of the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Huh. So the, um, so she, th- this was the first cocktail party, but cocktails were already called cocktails. Like before that, I don't know the history of. Elizabeth, I, I thought our agreement was no follow-up questions. No, okay. um, <laughs> no. I, you know, I, I think there were cocktails, but I make the term cocktail party, I believe, okay. that, was yeah. born at this mm-hmm. uh, St. Louis event. Okay. Yeah, you can ask my uh, supervisor. She's watching right now, and I always have follow-up questions. <laughs> I'm telling you, I think this will be in your performance review at the end of the year. <laughs> okay. One thing, Elizabeth, the questions you asked Brennan were a little too probing. <laughs> a little too much detail. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in my next book, boy, you'll be in the footnotes. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. Uh, Another audience question here. Did you write longhand with a pen and paper or pad, or did you compose directly on a computer or laptop? That's a great question. I use a computer and um, it's right over there. Can you see it? And this is exactly where I wrote the book. This is my office at my home, which is also, if you recognize the background, that's the Donnybrook set for Zoom. So that's, this is where okay. I am for Donnybrook. And I do use a, a Microsoft Word. Mm-hmm. And, um, but when I wrote Amazing St. Louis, I wrote part of it while driving to Florida. And my mm-hmm. wife would drive, I wasn't driving, but my <laughs> wife was driving and I would write on a yellow legal pad. That's so funny okay. you asked that. Yeah. One of the, one of the, Two, two of the chapters from Amazing St. Louis are in this book, but you didn't see them in Amazing St. Louis. Mm-hmm. The publisher of Amazing St. Louis did not like my entry on Masters and Johnson because it's for adults only, really. Mm-hmm. So that came into uh, the new book, Only in St. Louis, because he rejected that. Okay. And then I took it and used it in this book. But mm-hmm. also... There's a really interesting story about William Clark, which I find it interesting. Maybe it'll put you to sleep, but (laughs) William Clark not only went to the Pacific Northwest and back with Meriwether Lewis, Mm -hmm. and um, he, of course, was half of Lewis and Clark, but then he became the superintendent of Indian Affairs. Mm -hmm. And as such, he was the United States' embassy or liaison to the Indians. And he collected the biggest collection of Indian memorabilia Mm -hmm. and headwear and Mm -hmm. robes 
and uh, hawks, or rather uh, axes, he had a huge collection of Indian items from dozens of tribes. Okay. And it was on display in downtown St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then it went missing. It's believed that someone took the collection to Europe and never came back with it, but wow. nobody's entirely sure what happened to that, um, that collection. It was a collection that rivaled any other in uh, the new world. In fact, maybe now you have to go to uh, Europe to see it, but that, that wasn't clear to me. And I got that from the National Park Service, a, a bulletin that they sent out years ago. Oh, interesting. Um, I have one follow-up question. Oh, um, you might wonder why I brought that up. That I had written on longhand. Oh, and I, oh, I recently, no, no, no. and I found it. I found that story in my <laughs> files and it was written in longhand. I must have written it on the way to Florida. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, gotcha, okay. No, I was wondering if the, um, do you know was the collection on display? Like someone just like went in and took it all or was like in a box that they, they just like grabbed and went? It, it was on display in downtown okay. St. Louis. Okay. And famous people from all over the country came to see it. Uh, okay. Caitlin and others. Um, well, at, at some point, I believe it was taken by a flim flam artist who said he was going to tour it through Europe and he never came back. Okay. Huh. Now, the interesting thing about Clark, I believe, mm -hmm. is that his home is approximately where the north leg of the arch is today. And he not only had, he not only lived there, but he had two tenants in 19, or rather in 1838. Mm -hmm. One was a young Lieutenant from the Army Corps of Engineers who was in town to do some work on the river. His name was Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. The other was a fellow by the name of William Beaumont, okay. who uh, turned out to be what was known as the father of the human digestive system. And if you ever heard of Beaumont Hospital, Beaumont High School, yeah. that's the guy. So at okay. one point on one postage stamp of land in St. Louis, it, it, we had a leader in exploration, William Clark, li mm -hmm. leading, living with a military leader, future yeah. one, Robert E. Lee, living with a, mm -hmm. one of the top medical people of the 19th century. And that would have been William Beaumont. Wow. Yeah, a lot, as you said, on one postage stamp, it's a lot. Well, of... for, for a small little piece of property at the time, yeah. sure. Wow, wow. Um, okay, so we have a, a comment from a customer. Can't love Charlie more than I do. Great speaker and now author. Oh, that's nice to hear. Thanks, mom. <laughs> um, all right, another, another question here. How about a Charlie Brennan autobiography? Well, if you have trouble sleeping, I could probably write something up for you. Um, <laughs> I, I have I have thought of that, um, but I, I don't think there'd be much of an audience, but maybe for my kids or their children. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I just learned, for example, that uh, William Steritz, who is the CEO of Ralston Prina, has written his autobiography, but he hasn't released it. And I know that uh, Burt Walker, who we just lost earlier this year, he was the ambassador to Hungary and he headed up Stiefel Nicholas. He wrote a biography mm -hmm. and hasn't released it. And I'm thinking, it, mm -hmm. you know, if you write something, you probably should release it so people can read it unless yeah. there's something libelous or something mm -hmm. in it. But um, it would take a lot of time. I, I'm afraid mm -hmm. that it would seem presumptuous though. Okay, okay. Well, it looks like we got maybe one audience member who- Yeah, well, I could sell one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll have to take pre-orders. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, um, so if you uh, you met or so uh, or you mentioned uh, there there may be another volume here about the with the only in St. Louis stories, but are you working on any other project at this point, uh, writing project or? No, I have a couple of ideas, but okay. um, no, I. I I, I, I'm not right now. Right now, I'm just talking about the book and maybe in 2021, as you know, um, mm -hmm. writing a book is a pretty big commitment. So you give up a lot of other activities when you do write a book. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I'm not sure I want to set aside that kind of time right now. Mm -hmm. I, I usually have at least five years between books because it takes a little while to, to come mm -hmm. back. Um, mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, because I do enjoy the process, mm -hmm. I might do it. Okay. Okay. All right, audience members, sit tight. Yeah, well, or at least buy the first one. 
first or, or get it at the St. Charles City County Library. I really encourage people to go to Main Street Books mm -hmm. and get the book. But if not, hey, do what I do. Go to the library. Use the library. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you yep, can't buy every book out there. And I, I, I'm honest. I'm serious about that. Save yourself a buck and put the money in a mutual fund like Rex Singfield invented <laughs> and have a good retirement. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have a, a link here we'll put in the comments with all of Charlie's books at our library so you can oh, easily thanks. find um, all th or the only in St. Louis that's on its way and then the, his other two books. If you do go to um, Main Street Books, and there are some signed copies there as well. So um, that a wonderful uh, holiday gift there. Um, Please well. buy in bulk. What was that? Please buy in bulk. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I think you've already had to restock the store once, so it, we uh, have. And I do want yeah. to give a shout out for Main Street Books because I just think that Emily Hall Schroen is a remarkable young business person. Mm -hmm. She's got a lot of energy. She's got a great staff. I think the guy is Will, and then there's Mary Piazza. I think is mm -hmm. her name, and they're just the nicest people. You walk in there and you feel like you're at 84 Charing Cross Road. It really takes you back, and. Yeah. Um, we, we really got to support our local bookstores so that they're here for us and our kids and their kids because mm -hmm. I, I think they really add to the community, any community. I think Main Street is so lucky to have that book, uh, bookstore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we love working with Emily and we love sending authors there. Um, it is a wonderful um, ambiance when you get to go in and it's a cozy feeling and yes um, yeah it's just and i love so libraries too and please support the saint charles city county library because uh, you know the, this is not your father's library anymore you just went in there and got a book but there's so many different activities like this one that are scheduled and rebecca uh, rather you're doing a great job elizabeth i mean yeah. th this year always the thank you and, and, and it's a beautiful building too. I mean, it kind of, have you ever been to the Helsinki Library in Finland? I have not. It's kind of open like yours is too. Oh, and okay. I think that you should take a look at it on Google Images. They're okay. kind of similar to me. So, okay, oh, very cool. I will have to look into that. <laughs> oh. um, okay, so we've got a couple more audience questions working in that I want to, uh, to get here. Uh, what do you do to prepare for your radio show? Honest to goodness, you're not going to believe it, but the preparation never ends. All day, what, what are you laughing at? I'm, I'm honest. The, <laughs> there, there's no downtime because the mm -hmm. news cycle doesn't end anymore. It used to be you'd wake up in the morning and read the paper and that was your uh -huh. research and preparation. But now mm -hmm. there's so many sources of information, they never stop. You always mm -hmm. are on, you're getting idea from this area, from that area. And in, in our business, I'm not strictly news. So I'm looking for tidbits of information. Uh, Mike Dukakis recently had a campaign where he's encouraging people to boil the carcass of their turkeys after Thanksgiving. Don't waste it, he insisted. So we turned that into a topic. Recently, I saw pickleball and I said, you know, hmm. that is really going crazy. People are going nuts over that. So we're gonna turn that into a topic. And then every day there's just, some new piece of information from news or life that presents itself uh -huh. and it, it can be incorporated into the radio show. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of wish I had a, a C-SPAN show where I only interviewed authors. That way I would know all the material is going to be in the book. I don't have to worry <laughs> am I every single waking moment about collecting <laughs> info for the show. But when you do a show, and trust me, it's not rocket science and I'm not pitching tar on a roof in the hot sun or the cold. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not complaining, but mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it, mm -hmm. I, I wake up in the middle of the night, I think of, okay, what am I going to talk about? And mm -hmm. I, I talk to other people in the business and they do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have, uh, so on your like phone and tablet and devices, do you have notifications on or off? Are oh, you like, I, I got to go off and I think everyone's okay. supposed to, you saw social dilemma, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I haven't yet, actually. Oh, oh you? You've got to. The, okay. Those notifications are going to ruin your life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Folks, write your question. Please help me out. Tell Elizabeth that she's got to turn off her notifications. Okay. Um, but seriously, um, I, I, I follow, I subscribe to the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Boston Globe, the St. Louis Business Journal, the okay. Post-Dispatch. I just dropped the Washington Post, I think. Okay. Uh, but 
New York Times, Wall Street Journal, I mentioned those. Anyway, and then I have other information from looking at websites. And uh, then usually the night before or the morning of, Mm -hmm. uh, my co-host Amy comes up with some ideas. I come up with some, some ideas. And today, mm -hmm. I think we have about 15 topics. And I think we broached every single one of them. Hmm. Okay. And then tomorrow, uh, we have David Aguilar. He's a Harvard professor, astrophysicist from the uh, Smithsonian. He's going to talk about, you know, space. And then we have yeah. Jane Lynch from Glee. Did you ever see Glee? She was Sue Sylvester, I think. With, okay. Okay. And then she was also in... Uh, the 40 year old virgin Talladega uh -huh. nights. And she's been in oh. everything really. Yeah. So she's, she has this Christmas song out. And okay. then a friend of mine from high school who spent 10 years in prison, mm -hmm. but he's written a very good book on personal finance. His name is Brad Stinn. He's a Harvard guy. Okay. Uh, and the book is called roadside scholar. And it's a very understandable book on how mm -hmm. to accumulate wealth. Hmm. Cool. So quite a wide variety. If you don't turn tune into uh, Charlie's morning show, you'll yeah, you, yeah, you'll right. find something course, you're interested in. Then there's the local news and whatever mm -hmm. the president is saying or tweeting. So mm -hmm. it really never ends. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, I will turn my notifications off though. <laughs> well, I hope you do. <laughs> They're gonna frazzle you. Okay. I leave my phone on silent a lot, so I just don't even notice it. But oh well, th that's one way to do it too. Okay. And truth be told, I think my texts are notified. I, I get a little ding when the texts come in. Oh, okay. I think, but the other notifications, I think they're off. I, I better double check that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. Um, I, I'm kind of worried about mm -hmm. our society because I, I think that we're accumulating a lot of information in very small bits. We don't have time for anything. And yet all of the, this technology was supposed to give us more time. And mm -hmm. I don't think we really have it. I mean, that's yeah, my opinion. it's kind of the bombardment of information and not really having the time to chew it, uh, chew the information and process the information. Um, right. Which, why, yeah. why does the electronic information mm -hmm. rack our nerves Mm -hmm. But if I walk into a library like yours, I feel at peace. Now, both have lots of information. Mm -hmm. One makes me a nervous wreck, mm -hmm. you know, the, the iPhone, the computer, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the other lull, just makes me feel great walking mm -hmm. uh, among the stacks. I don't get it. Yeah. yeah. Maybe something about the variety of like sensory input that you have or with the electronic device, it's just it's kind of just visual and one. Whereas in the, the physical space, you have a lot more. Uh, I think you probably, you're probably right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll <laughs> we won't go off on that tangent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. We've got one, one question here. I'm not quite sure what this is, um, but do you have any thoughts about what happened to the green lease kidnapping money? Oh, you know, there's a new book on that. Mm -hmm. Bobby Greenlease. Uh -huh. had uh, wealthy parents and I, and I think he was abducted, right? And killed. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to somebody about this yesterday when we were walking at seven mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning. And I think my friend Pierce told me there's a new book out on this subject. So mm -hmm. I apologize. That was before my time, the green lease okay. uh, murder. Mm -hmm. But for more information, I believe Tim O'Neill, formerly of the Post-Dispatch, has written about it in a couple of books about St. Louis crime, um, which we're, we're at the, I'm sure at the St. Charles City County yeah. Library. Okay. But okay. because um, that viewer brought that up, I'm gonna look into that and try and get that author on the program. You know, people seem to be very interested in crime. Uh, the, some of the top podcasts involve crime, as you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got, I look, my favorite story about crime in the book is that there was an attorney by the name of Morris Shanker in St. Louis, and he represented Jimmy Hoffa, um, who went to jail, and Tony G, who was a mobster, Buster Wortman, another mobster, guy by the name of Callahan, who was with the Teamsters, and then mm -hmm. he went to prison for improper behavior. And it was said that Morris Shanker uh, represented everybody on the city docket, that mean, meaning everybody who had a case in front of the court. Mm -hmm. And uh, a St. Louis mayor, when he needed a chairman of the Crime Commission, he appointed Morris Shanker to be the chairman of the St. Louis Crime Commission. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, 
well, no wonder we've never made a dent in crime. Yeah. We, you know, go figure of all the people out there. But yeah, and in fact, he was under indictment when he died in 1989, oh, Shanker wow. himself. Okay. An, uh, an immigrant, I believe, from Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Oh, okay. Hmm. Right. I know you've got some uh, background studying yes. in Russia. Yeah. You lived yeah. in Russia for a while. Study. Yes, I did. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for a little over, I uh, think collectively a little over a year I was over there. So. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And are your views of Russia different from the views that people have from the mainstream media generally? Um, I guess. Well, so my experience was meeting, uh, I met some really wonderful people, mm -hmm. um, I guess, it, it's the, the wonderful, caring people when I was living over there. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess, is, does that kind of answer? I, well, yeah. I or, feel that many people today believe that Russia is the enemy. And oh, I don't know okay. where that came because as recently as President Obama, I mean, mm -hmm. they weren't our closest ally, uh -huh. but we weren't we were we weren't afraid that we were in a cold war again. Right. Like, yeah. I feel that there are people who are marching in that direction. Uh huh. Yeah. No, I think that the the people that I met and interacted with, I think, were um, uh, yeah, some very wonderful, caring mm -hmm. uh, Russian-speaking people. So. Oh my gosh. Now I, I've only been to St. Petersburg. I haven't been to Moscow, okay. but yeah. It, it, it's a study in contrast because mm -hmm. in St. Petersburg, you can see some pretty down and out areas, but maybe mm -hmm. kind of like the United States, you see some areas that are really impressive. And mm -hmm. I was walking down one of the main streets there and I saw a huge mural of okay. Miles Davis, the oh, jazz okay. great from East St. Louis. I thought, wow, mm -hmm. that guy's something. Yeah, oh, how interesting. I, yeah. Have, I have Miles Davis in the book because at one point he actually uh, played basketball with um john lennon and today after this um yeah Zoom facebook live meeting people can go on youtube and look at it neither of them were destined for the nba mm -hmm. but I, I also found a st louis connection to john lennon because he told playboy magazine that he uh, was inspired to write the song imagine one of his greatest from yeah. a book of poems that was given to him by a st louisan by the name of dick gregory okay oh wow yeah, so there's a St. Louis connection to that great Connection hit. to that song, yeah. Exactly. Oh, nice. Huh. Um, okay, so we have another comment here. Thank you, Charlie, for being an ambassador for our city. You have done so much for our region as much as any Native son. Thank you. Oh, I, I don't believe that to be true, but thank <laughs> you very much. It's very, it's very kind of you to say that. Oh, um, Back to um, your comment here about the pe people that are interested into true crime and curiosities. We do have a series on that. So we have about um, once a month. Uh, and if you um, yeah, would like to join us for the true crime and curiosities uh, events at some point, we would love to have you. Um, I would so love that. That'd be so interesting. Uh, do, you, yep. do, do you pick a different one every week or, or yeah, every so month? Yeah, so it's a different topic every month. Oh. Um, yeah, we have a... a, a few librarians um, that, that schedule those and find different topics that people are real interested in. So um, yeah, so we would love to have you back for that. Oh, that's it. That's excellent. You know, and I have a little bit of crime, you know, Buster Wortman was uh, the yeah. East uh, St. Louis gangster and mm -hmm. he had a moat around his house, a, a, an actual moat. You don't see that too much anymore. Yeah. And actually Jimmy Connors, the tennis great, grew up mm -hmm. in East St. Louis before he moved to Belleville, but he he wrote in his autobiography about uh, being in a East St. Louis restaurant one night when Buster Workman's crowd knocked the door down and they started shooting up the place. And Jimmy and his mother, Gloria and others, ran into the kitchen to escape the gunfire. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, later, of course, one of my favorite stories about uh, Jimmy Connors mm -hmm. is that in 1975, he was in the men's singles championships at Wimbledon against Arthur Ashe. And huh. both of them went to high school in St. Louis, Arthur Ashe at Sumner. Yeah. And then, and he lived in Richmond Heights at 1220 South Laclede Station Road in the yeah. home of um, the Hudland family. He was originally from Richmond, but he came here for high school to play tennis. And yeah. then uh, Jimmy Connors. So 1975, it was really the battle of St. Louis with Connors versus Ashe and Ashe won that year. Okay. Okay. Oh, 
So there's a lot of St. Louis history like that. You know, I, I have like little St. Louis connections or I didn't know there was a connection. And yeah, I have a book I, called, You Can't Make This Up. But my favorite chapter is really the last one. Okay. Um, the last one looks at people who are kind of written off when they were young and they became okay. huge successes. Okay. There's a professor at WashU who mm -hmm. also is on the faculty at Harvard. Her name is Liberty Vitter. She's a professor of data science in the Department of Mathematics. Okay. And she was told by her freshman high school teacher that she, was, she shouldn't even take mathematics because she would not even pass algebra. Wow. Then um, there's a guy by the name of John Costello who flunked first, he was at St. Pius in Glasgow Village. He, he, had, he had learning disorder. So Costello flunked first grade, second grade and fourth grade twice. And he then later ended up going to the perfect high school for people with dyslexia, uh -huh. CBC, get it, CBC. And um, he, he did well. And then he went to Rockhurst. And now he's the head of a major corporation. He, he, he owns a company, CK Power, has 400 employees in about six states. But wow. you, you can imagine how he was teased growing up. Yeah. Uh, and then Jackie Smith, the NFL Hall of Famer who played for the St. Louis Cardinals football team, uh -huh. he only played in four high school games, four games, his entire high school experience. Um, sure. Kellen Winslow came out of East St. Louis. He's a Hall of Famer. He was a great tight end for San Diego. Mm -hmm. He didn't play football till his senior year in high school. Um, wow. Bob Pettit, who was an NBA Hall of Famer, mm -hmm. he has more all-star MVPs than anyone except for Kobe Bryant. Okay. He uh, got cut from his sophomore team in high school. And mm -hmm. Aeneas Williams, who's in the NFL Hall of Fame, he, he, he didn't get a single sports scholarship coming out of high school. Not one. And he went to Southern University. He didn't play football his freshman year, his sophomore year, and he walked onto the team his uh, junior year. Yeah. And of course, he became a great cornerback for the yeah. Cardinals and for the Rams. And now he's in the NFL yeah. Hall of Fame. And uh, there's a lot of stories like that in this whole chapter, yeah. last chapter, where mm -hmm. people who, you know, you like Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer runs Shake Shack Restaurant. He started it along with a lot of great restaurants in New York. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he applied to college. He didn't get into one college. Yeah. He was rejected by all of them. Huh. I mean, yeah. you don't think of those things. Uh, mm -hmm. David Sanborn, great jazz saxophonist out of Kirkwood. Of course, he grew up with polio and he was always the last one picked as a kid yeah. uh, on the sports teams. But Bernie Federko, who's an NHL Hall of Famer, mm -hmm. told me that actually it's in his book. He said when he grew up, he was always the last one picked for hockey. For hockey. Wow. So, there are other yeah. stories too, but I, I, um, I might turn that into like a graduation speech or something because yeah. I really like those stories because sometimes people think that, you know, you have to be a triple A rated tennis player by ninth grade. And right. You got to start young and you got to have that path and you're going on it, you know, by the time you right. can walk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Jack Dorsey, who is the CEO of two huge corporations, Square and Twitter, he's worth about $9 billion now, but. <laughs> You know, he was a barista in his mom's coffee yeah. shop, Shenandoah Coffee in South St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, he was a, yeah. he, he had dropped out of New York University. And then a guy by the name of Jim McKelvey came in one day for coffee and he said, can anyone hear code? Because I need a coder, right. C-O-D-E. <laughs> and the rest is history. The two yeah. kind of joint forces. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think you have a picture of that story in the book. There's lots of photographs throughout too. Um, that yeah, along with the drawings, um, the photographs are really cool. Just well, thanks a lot. Yeah, those are kind of from my personal collection where I, um, yeah. ex except from Greg Myrie. Now, Greg is mm -hmm. a Parkway kid. Mm -hmm. um, he has a phenomenal story. He wrote the last chapter. A lot of people think that's the best. You know, I, I wrote the, the last chapter I wrote is what I just described, but mm -hmm. he gave us a bonus entry. He's mm -hmm. the national security correspondent for NPR. Mm -hmm. Grew up in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, and then he played basketball Parkway and then he said, you know, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do for college. So mm -hmm. he went to St. Louis Community College for two years and played basketball. Mm -hmm. And then he, he applied to other schools, you know, after two years, it's done. Mm -hmm. He got into Yale yeah, and he decided to ask the famous coach there, Carmen Casa, can, can I play football? Mm -hmm. And you know, what? Well, anyway, he got on the football team. So he played 
basketball yeah. at St. Louis Community College and then football at Yale all within four years. And then he right. got out of Yale and he worked for the Associated Press, then the New York Times. Mm -hmm. He was the Jerusalem correspondent for the New York Times. And now he's a uh, senior national security correspondent for NPR. It's kind wow. of interesting because yeah. he, he didn't study journalism as it turns out. He did or didn't? No, he did not. No. Of course not. <laughs> yeah. He broke all the rules. Right, yeah. But I, I love that. I like when people break rules. There's a guy out of Belleville by the name of Bob Golby. Mm -hmm. And he, his family didn't have much money, but they did live near a, a country club. And okay. Golby would sneak onto the country club when play was done for the day. And he would practice his golf until about 10 o'clock at night by moonlight. And he'd yeah. come home and his mother would say, you have no business being on that golf course. Yeah. Well, he became pretty good. He never played in high school, did not play in college. Yeah. Out of college, he was in the Korean War. So mm -hmm. that, that went three years. Mm -hmm. And then out of, out after that, he, he, he became a golf pro because he was pretty good at golf. He right. taught himself um, on yeah. this country club in Belleville mm -hmm. by moonlight. And you know what? He won the Masters in 1968. Yeah. Never played on a high school or college team. Yeah. Just self-taught, following his uh, kind of like his passion or his instinct or his, you know. Right. Yeah. And and when he won, it's kind of funny. He, you know, you get a green jacket when you win the Masters. Right. Yeah. So he went home on a TWA flight, wearing the green jacket, and then he got a call the next day. Hey, Bob, you know the green jacket is supposed to stay here in Augusta. You're not supposed to take it home. <laughs> He said he didn't know because, but it, he wasn't a rules follower. If he was a rules follower, he wouldn't have been on that golf course at night. But there's another guy too, Jay Williamson. Jay, phenomenal golfer. Jay Williamson has won more money on the PGA Tour than Jack Nicholas or Arnold Palmer. Oh, wow. Uh, he did not play in high school or college. Yeah. He was a baseball player okay. at Trinity. Uh -huh. Same same college that Danny Meyer eventually went to in Hartford. Uh -huh. And when he in spring training of his senior year, he's in Florida. And he's uh -huh. sitting on the ground reading the newspaper of all the golf scores. It's like 71, 72, 73. He goes, you know what? I could do that. Yeah. And his friend said, what? He goes, I could shoot 71, 72. And everyone laughed at him. Uh -huh. And then when he graduated from Trinity, he started playing golf. And next thing you know, he's on the PGA Tour. Huh. So what I'm trying to say yeah. is, even if you weren't the captain of the golf team your senior year in high school, mm -hmm. that's not your destiny. Don't Life's give not up. Over. Yeah. Right. <laughs> huh. Very cool. So we have one question about um your how you're remembering all this, all these facts and that. Um so our, our uh customer has um, I bet he rocks at trivia. How do you keep all those facts in the forefront of your brain? Your delivery is impressive and great. It's, it's more and more difficult. And I, I do find myself having to pick up the book at times and then uh, looking in the index. Okay, what was the name of that atheist that Tom Villa quoted? And it was Bertrand Russell. Tom Villa was the president of the Board of Aldermen. And his prayer one time was a, was, was a quote from Bertrand Russell, maybe the most famous atheist, right? Yeah. So the reporters said to Villa, what, you, know, you, know, you know, you just quoted an atheist in your prayer. And Villa told him, yeah, well, next week, I'm going to quote Nietzsche. Of course, <laughs> Nietzsche wrote, God is dead. But anyway, welcome to St. Louis. Only in St. Louis. I, I'm having increasing difficulty remembering, remembering some of these. But if, if you go over them as much as an author does by writing it, rewriting it, editing it, proofreading, they, they, they tend to stick in your craw. But thank you very much. I'm actually not very good at trivia, um, unless it's St. Louis trivia. Okay. But well, anything trivia, else? Trivia is a St. Louis thing. I, did you re, like kind of see that too coming from Ohio or is it an Ohio thing too? Because oh, I no. came down here and I was like, trivia? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. St. Louis has so many fundraisers or did, and they kind of go in and out of style. Trivia was a big one for a long time. We had a lot of roasts before you moved here. I, I know mm -hmm. your older, um, the older viewers out there will remember when we, <laughs> someone was always getting roasted around here. And then, of course, there's the golf tournaments, mm -hmm. um, auctions. Oh, my gosh, there's so many auctions. And then the auctions kind of moved into fund the need, where you don't even get anything. You just have to raise your paddle. Anyway, we've all been to all those things. But I'm not that good at trivia, uh, unless it's 
the subject matter, if, if the category is St. Louis, then I'm pretty good. But I should be because I've been eating, sleeping, and drinking St. Louis for right. a few years. Yeah. When you think about it, and this is kind of a, I've been doing this in five decades. Wow. Okay. And I started in 88, so that's the 80s, mm -hmm. 90s, the aughts, the teens, and now yeah. in the 20s. That's five. Yeah. Oh. That's sick. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know your specialty. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. No, I, I enjoy it. One of my points is that St. Louis is not a boring town, that it's got so many eccentricities and mm -hmm. people with character, and there's a lot of great stories here. Right. So I try to capture a lot of them and put them in here. Yeah. But I, I, I'm sure that many people who frequent the library will be familiar with a number of these stories. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But I thought um, the stories kind of tell our tale. You know, we, we learn about a city or a town or a country by the stories we share. And mm -hmm. it's kind of a grandiose hope probably will never happen, but I hope some of these stories kind of become part of the fabric that they're told again and again, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that we're telling stories other than, mm -hmm. oh, the Rams moved out and there's a lot of crime, mm -hmm. right? Right, okay. okay. And I came from Boston where, you know, there are always stories about this or that. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly, I moved here. I, I didn't think there was any history, like I said. And my dad sent me an article from the Washington Post and I still have it. This is about 1988. It said that St. Louis is one of the most historical cities in the world. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe Philadelphia, New York, London, St. Louis. But the more I'm here, I do believe that our region, not just St. Louis mm -hmm. city, but the region is very historic. And in St. Charles, I mean, for example, I, I do have the fact that the Air Force's biggest weapon is actually made in St. Charles. I bet most people in St. Charles know that. It's called the Massive Ordnance Penetrator. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a, a very big bomb that can be dropped on a, let, let's say a site is below ground, six stories below ground because they're making enriched uranium or plutonium or something like that for nuclear bombs. Right. This Massive Ordnance Penetrator, the MOP, should be able to go into the ground wow. and destroy its target. And it's, it's actually made at the Phantom Works facility by Boeing in mm -hmm. St. Charles. It's very secret. I find a lot of people don't know about it, but I, I, I bet a lot of people in St. Charles know okay. of it very well. I hadn't heard of it, but- um, I'm Really? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> I read about it in the Los Angeles. The area, we'll say that. No, I, I read about it in the Los Angeles Times. It hasn't been, oh, okay. it hasn't received a lot of coverage here. Yeah, around here. Huh, interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, we have um, one question quick about the book. Um, I know this book is a signed copy. Are all the copies at uh, Main Street Books signed, or is they there are a now? Okay. They are now, and. Mm -hmm. We do have some sort of um, paper shortage and we're behind in getting new ones printed up, but we hope by the 9th, which I think is Wednesday, we'll have mm -hmm. more. And so sure. um, okay. we'll try and refill those shelves. Okay. I, last time I checked, I was between Peter Frampton and Barack Obama Okay. at, at Main Street Books uh, on the shelf, not in sales. Oh, okay. They're yeah. actually out on the front table right now. I was in there today. So um, Emily got them out, yeah, front front display for you. Um, but yeah, run in and get your signed copy. Um, and you can call the bookstore too, and she can, uh, uh, she or um, Will or Mary can set one aside for you. Um, so yes, thank you so much, Charlie, for coming tonight. You are very impressive, and we love that you love St. Louis. Um, and we are very happy to have you back uh, anytime. So hopefully in person, and you can sign the books yourself. <laughs> Um, Next time we do it, we have to have, um, like, it'll have to be in a setting. Are you allowed to have beer at the uh, St. Louis, or rather St. Charles City County Library? Um, yes, we have to jump through some hoops, um, but yes. I think we should do beer and pretzels. Kind of beer okay. and pretzels okay. with um, Elizabeth's notifications off. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> but, but thank you for turning your uh, phone off during the show, or at least putting it on silent. Oh, of course. Yeah. I turn notifications off on all my devices because I'm yes. at work and I'm doing my work. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we, so yes, we would love to have you back. And we really thank you for your support of the library. 
Um, and uh, yeah, having us yeah, have your books to check out and also just um, all the wonderful, nice things that you said. We really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Ms. Nelson. And uh, hopefully we can uh, talk again before too long, when the dust settles, as they say. Right, yes, definitely. Um, for all those watching um, on Facebook, there'll be a survey in the comments shortly, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, please let us know what we did well and uh, what we should keep doing for our virtual classes and events, and then what we can improve upon as well. Uh, if you like what you um, see tonight or you're interested in um, more classes and events, please go to mylibrary.org e-calendar. We have lots of different classes on topics um, for all different ages. So thank you again for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful evening.